Now, before we get underway, I just want to give a shout out to this month's sponsor of Electric Speed. That's my free newsletter, which comes out every two weeks. It just went out this past Saturday. Uh, the sponsor is the Writing Consultancy with Britta Jensen. Uh, she offers editing and revision guidance. And for people who read me or interact with me on social, you can book a free call with her at the link you see on the slide. So that's a bit.ly link, bit.ly slash editing free call. She would be delighted to speak with you if you're looking to revise and submit with confidence. Thank you, Britta. All right, so let me introduce you to David, David Kern. Um, David is an art teacher and mentor in Canada, in, in Ottawa. He released his first book last fall, 18 pieces about creative painting, and you can see him right there posing with his book. Um, the book launched at the main gallery at the Ottawa School of Art, and that's where you teach David, correct? Yes, indeed. Yes. Yes. So. Um, and so I would consider it, and I think you too consider it, David, a, a successful marketing campaign or launch, and you've got some nice press coverage, and you've got an interview with local cable TV, so this is all very good. Um, and the book is on consignment uh, with a number of local outlets, including the National Gallery of Canada, which sounds very impressive to me, um, yeah. so the, very cool. And you're wanting to be active in the art world and push wider visibility from there. Now, we have a lot more to say about this book and your situation, but um, and but before I move on to your specific challenge, is there anything else you want to add to this, David, to this little, this quick portrait that I've drawn? Actually, no, not not much, because that's that's just a wonderful summation, right? I mean, it, it is a, it's a personal book, but uh, I, I, I think it has some sort of general themes which I hope resonate too so so I've uh, I've been uh, very pleased with how it's been accepted in the local market here in Ottawa but uh, you know I just feel there's a bit more and and I want there to be a, a bit more so uh, so here we are great okay excellent so when David wrote to me, um, I have a business clinic application where people can discuss their problems. I'll share that link at the end of today's session if you want to submit your own application. But I distilled what he told me into the following. And he said, my challenge is to make my book more visible, to drive sales, and in parallel develop follow-on products. But which activities should I invest time in and how? Is it sensible to pursue an arrangement with a publisher? What activities are likely to provide most leverage? Um, and you mentioned specifically, David, you know, guest posts, author talk, signing, social media. You've also got some high profile clients. Um, so you also expressed, how can I best engage them for networking and endorsements? Excellent question. And then companion publications, like should there be an ebook? Um, so these are the types of questions. I, I David, I, I just really liked the challenge you expressed in your application because I hear these sorts of concerns from a lot of different people, um, even many, many, many years after release. So you're still a little bit close um, to your launch date, but I still think you're, whether it's been six months or six years out, people tend to lose momentum or they feel like they're stalling out and they're wondering, what can I do now that the book isn't fresh and new? And it's that's not the news story in itself. You have to find some other ways to keep the ball rolling. Right. And, but, and honestly, Jane, I, I am I am like 100 percent sure that if we were doing this in a year's time, I'd be saying the same things. Right? <laughs> yes, you know, because exactly. I'm just I'm just like stopped now. Yeah. Yep. Yep, this is very normal. So I just I want everyone to know that there's nothing wrong or um, the, the, it's not a failing that like every author faces this challenge and every publisher too. Um, and unfortunately, publishers tend to just move on to the next season of books <laughs> rather than, you know, keep supporting the older ones. Uh, a, a problem as old as time. Okay, so First, I want to knock out one of the initial questions you raised because it's so easy to answer and we can just set it aside very quickly, which is it is so difficult to get a traditional publisher to take on a self-published book that I'm not sure I would even attempt it. Now, that said, I, I want to tell you, David, if you happen to have a connection with a Canadian publisher who does this sort of book and you have like author friends who've been published by this publisher, like 
if that were the case, I would encourage you to explore that. Is that true for you? Do you have? Well, yeah, it, it's it's half true actually, and and, and uh, cutting to the chase, I I probably like agree with just what you what you've said because I I, I do have a connection with uh, with a Canadian publisher, and and uh, I've had a good conversation with them, and they they essentially said it was uh, you know the camel and the needle that would be pretty well what they said, and. Uh, yes. You know, it's 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 very haphazard and time dependent, and you know the, it, whether there's some particular, you know, sort of you know viable currency. So so yeah, unless unless it falls in my lap, because uh, uh, like essentially a publisher came to me. I think that that's the way I see it too. Yeah, yeah, I we're on the same page here, David. I think. Usually, I don't even think it's worth the time and energy to even attempt it unless you've just got a warm lead. Um, and yeah. like, you know, it, it just makes total sense. And otherwise, it's like pulling teeth to get anyone to take a look at the project. Um, now, I do think there's some unique qualities of your book. The fact that it's a full color illustrated book does to me like it would sure be nice to have a publisher to take on the expense of printing that. <laughs> but, you know, it's unlikely to happen especially unlikely, yeah. in the given the current supply chain very unlikely to happen okay so we'll just put that aside for now now one thing i'd like to do before we talk about specific like marketing promotion publicity pr of any kind is to make sure that the book's foundation is reasonably strong like there's nothing that we can quickly do to shore things up because all of the pr and marketing in the world uh, will fail if there's something with the book that just kills the deal before you even get a conversation started. So you, there are lots of, depending on the genre or category, there can be more criteria here, but I usually boil it down to the cover, the pricing, the book description, and the reviews. Now, in this case, I think the cover totally fits the book. It's, and it's, you know, it's your artwork. I don't think there's any issue here with the cover. Um, although I've seen some authors with covers that just don't fit the genre or category that they're publishing into, and that's stopping sales from happening. I don't, that's, but that's not happening here, at least by my estimation. The pricing looks appropriate to me. So I think it, you're, you've priced it at $30 Canadian and it's a soft cover. Is that right, David? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, I did. And I've not had any, um, uh, feedback other than you know some some saying it was underpriced but uh, the I think those people you know don't don't really know that things kind of drop off a cliff if you overprice things so so yeah, yeah. Yep. the margin's tight but I think that's the price it has to be yes yes I think it's reasonable um, I think when it shows up on U.S. sites it's around 24 or something like that I don't I don't quite understand how the conversion happens and if it's flexible, but in any event, it looks good in US prices as well. So the two areas I'd like to focus on are the book description and the reviews, because I do think you can probably get some quick wins there before you go out and do additional marketing. Um, before I get to that, though, I notice in the chat, Naomi is asking if uh, about the self-publishing question, if there's the same issue with traditionally published book that's out of print with getting a publisher to take on a self-published book. Um, it's a little bit different, Naomi, for books that have gone out of print. Sometimes you can get a publisher on board for the next edition if they see demand in the market. Uh, it's just it can be challenging to show that there's that demand. Um, and the, usually there has to be some sort of revision of the book, or there has to be a strong persuasive reason to bring it back into print. Um, so depending on what category we're talking about, you may need to write a proposal if it were nonfiction. If it's fiction or a children's book, you, you, know, you may need to show like, well, I've got all of these new books that are doing really well, and my readers really want to go back and read this older title, but it's not available, and now the price is at $1,000 per edition on Amazon. <laughs> if you can make that sort of argument, then you're in a good position. But if it's like crickets out there, um, not such a great position. Okay, so moving on. Now, the book description I found is the, and by book description, I mean what I found on Amazon, which I assume is being replicated across like all online retail outlets. 
Um, it's roughly the same as the author's note that's in the book. And so I'll, I'll just quickly read the first paragraph or so of the description. David Kern didn't choose to become an artist. He didn't study formally, yearn for it in idle moments, nor plan a change in lifestyle. However, opportunity arose and art appeared as though stirring from a very long sleep. Big things start out small, and before David knew it, he was transported down a road, signposted art. Um, join him on a journey into the mysterious heart of a creative world and the wonders of discovery. David has a knack for connecting underlying ideas and principles, shining a light on the enigmatic and its magic. This book includes some practical and enabling ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so in the author's note, this is basically the same, but it's in first person. Um, and it's a great author's note, but I think it's not the best possible book description. And so when I went out searching for some other copy <laughs> that I could use, I actually found some really good copy that I imagine your was it uh, where you wherever you had your signing or the launch the Ottawa School of Art, uh, um, their event copy was actually quite good. Do you remember it? Uh, not offhand, but I I probably wrote it. So maybe you probably I, wrote it. Maybe too. I got okay. my text text all mixed up. Yeah. Okay, so I think this is what I would use instead because it's. I think it's going to help people who, especially if they're shopping online, who may not know you yet or have just the vaguest idea of who you are. Right. Okay. So for many years, David Kern has inspired new and established artists to explore their creative spirit. Now he's gathered many of his insights and proven techniques into one unique encompassing resource, including a hundred images of his own work. David's paintings and sketches adeptly capture reflections of the human condition. He has completed a wide range of commissions, et cetera. It, I think because this book is so much you and your work, um, I think we, especially for people who might not know you, we need to understand kind of like, why are we going to listen to you or why do we wanna know what you have to say on this topic? So this helps build you up as um, an expert and authority. Um, it's not as like colloquial and casual as the other one. I think this is, especially for online marketing, like if someone hits your Amazon page and we're buying online, this is the direction that I would go in. Um, there's right. a, um, there's a really good post by an agent, uh, Anna Sproul Latimer on how to write a bio. So if you just Google her name along with writing a bio, you'll come up with her full, um, I think she spends like 2000 words explaining how to write a great bio and it's for a, she's actually instructing people on how to do this for a book proposal. I think it works also really well for this sort of copy when the book is really focused on you. Um, so what do you think David is, is this like ringing true to you or you feel a little uncomfortable? No, no. I actually, I, I I love it because, you know, when, when I was doing it, I was, you know, I was probably a little bit you know sort of a little bit overwhelmed by the whole process because i was essentially doing everything uh, uh, by myself although I, i'm very i'm i'm happy with like all the the text that uh that i've got was you know i had i had some some good support with this and i and i recognize these words as being different words but i've got them and but and and i i'd be it's like so easy to change that for online marketing, I'll, pro I'll probably do that this afternoon. Yes. The, I mean, because, yeah, uh, I, I mean, I can't change what's on the, the, the other words, they're on the back of the book. I can't That's change it. that, yes. but I can, anything, anything that, uh, that uh, that's, that's in the virtual world, I can, I can, I can definitely, I, I will definitely do that. Yeah. Excellent. And I see Fan in the chat is, uh, or no, Kimberly, sorry. Kimberly is asking, could these insights and proven techniques be used by people who are not visual artists? How, what would you say, David? I, actually, that, I, I aspire to that, right? Okay. The, you know, I, I, I feel I've got to be careful not to, uh, to, to be too, too, too broad, but because there are, painting specific things in the uh, in the book but but there's a whole section of, that's essentially about you know the creativity and uh, and the uh, the my experience in creativity 
uh, and kind of turning things a little bit on their on on upside down and like doing things first and then thinking about it because you know that's 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 key is it's it's is you know you know great creative things happen when you're actually uh doing the art or doing the writing I, it's exactly the same with writing i mean just just mm -hmm. start writing and then the the ideas come right so 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 i do go into that sort of thing uh which i hope has a has a wider art audience mm -hmm. than than just p painters and people interested mm. in painting. Mm. Uh, but I've just been careful not to take it too far because I felt I might just be off of my home ground there. Yeah. Well, this actually brings up a really important principle, which is to market well, you generally have to go narrow. So it's always very tempting to look at how your book might apply to adjacent fields or adjacent fields, or like, you know, uh, like writing or other people who, you know, are looking to explore creativity. But for the purposes of today, I would say that is a bad direction to go in because we want to build on what you're most known for and the easiest people to reach, which are going to be artists. And then right. I would, I would consider it an advanced longer term marketing or publicity to think about, okay, what could I write on this topic? That would be for a, a broader audience. And then you start experimenting or testing out with those adjacent audiences, but I wouldn't start there. Um, so I think your instincts are correct to not go too broad yeah. uh, actually great that's great jane if i just might pick up on that i mean actually since since uh, the book came out th this year you know my wife and i have done a couple of uh uh webinars on uh, you know creativity you know you know springboarding on painting mm -hmm. but focusing more on on the nature of creativity and being creative yes so that that that's kind of our experimentation to to kind of see what we can do as a next uh next step you know rather than you know through this book di directly yeah right exactly exactly right okay so let me talk about getting reviews this is something that is a pain for every single author. It's not easy for anyone. We are all in the same kind of frustrating boat <laughs> of getting reviews. Um, there are two types of reviews here I want to talk about. One is what we call editorial reviews or blurbs, these you know endorsements where people say nice things about you. Um, and then customer reviews, which are different. These are people who are generally strangers and they've purchased the book or read the book and now they're going to rate you. Um, so reviews of all kinds help with online sales specifically. They can also help you when you're going out to approach other people or institutions or organizations because they help just show that these other people thought this was valuable, so you probably will too. Um, for now, because you do have some wins already, like you've been covered by the media locally, you can say things like as featured by the Ottawa School of Art or the National Gallery of Canada, like you can say those things and it's very powerful. But there's always more that you can do, right? So your Amazon page specifically was pretty bare. I don't think you had any reviews at the time that I looked I, of either kind. So certainly if you want to sell more online, and I'm saying online very deliberately, um, then you will need to think about getting something on that page. So this is where I think your high profile clients might be useful. Um, mm -hmm. This is one possible thing you could ask them for. Sorry, my cat is leaning on my keyboard now. Uh, <laughs> okay, you could send them an email or call them or however you normally communicate. It could be in person if you see them regularly and ask them for a blurb that you, what in Amazon parlance, this would be putting an editorial review on your book page. And then it could also go on the book. If you do reprints, it can go on your website. There are lots of uses for these endorsements. Now, if, if for some reason that's not appropriate, you can ask them for something else. And so here I kind of have a little bulleted list of how you would make this approach. If you email them, rule number one is you keep the email short. And by short, I mean like 200 words, if that. 
you note your established wins or social proof in case they don't know it yet. Um, and then you make a very specific ask. This is the, probably the most important part. You don't want to like leave the door open to whatever you want to do. You just want to make it very easy for them to say yes or no. And asking for a blurb is very specific and you can even write the blurbs for them. <laughs> So this is not a bad thing. You can tell them exactly what you want them to say, give them a list of three to five and they pick one. I've done this myself. Um, and then you can, if you want to, if it's someone you feel comfortable with, you could have both what we call the easy ask and then a harder ask um, where one is just a lower commitment, the other is a higher commitment. And so this just increases the chance they're gonna say yes to one and maybe both if they really like you. And then finally, whatever you do, just make sure that whatever you're asking for is appropriate. Like you would probably not send exactly the same email, like identical to every single person because people have different things that they might do for you. The one person you might want them to make an introduction to a bookstore or to an, an event or to a festival or to some other important person. So just make sure you're using the opportunity in the best way. So what do you, have you done any of this outreach where you just blatantly asked endorse me? <laughs> uh, no, I've, 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 I've thought about it and, and, uh, and listening to you, uh, uh, go through the, the, the kind of ideas. I, I, I think I'd be on, on point for, for, for what to do. It's just that, uh, uh, the when 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 the whole thing came out it was too late for that right so you know if it like if if i if i could have got copies out beforehand to some of these people you know maybe maybe i could have got a uh a, a, a uh an introduction or something like that i did think about that by the way but the you know the the you know timing timing wasn't good for uh for for you know the people that uh that I was, uh, I could have, like contacting them at that time would not have been the right thing to do. Right, right. The, uh, but uh, since then I've kind of, kind of uh, gone, uh, gone a little bit quiet and, 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 I, and I really like this idea of, of, uh, of, of picking up and asking them for their, 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 their impressions or uh, some comments on the book and saying, you know, that I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing more things and, you know, this is going to lead to other, you know, activities in the, in the, uh, in, in the market. In, in fact, perhaps, you know, sort of telling them a little bit about, you know, what, what, what I'm doing next as well. Right. Yeah. So it's not kind of a, like a dead end, like this, not, yes. this book is not a dead end. It's the first piece of a, right. of, uh, of a process. Right. So, yeah. so I very much like this, uh, this Jane and, and, and I'll absolutely, uh, uh, so, sort of, uh, contact some uh, some people over the next uh, next week or two probably before the summer comes right because yeah. i guess they're yeah, sending sending people requests for reviews in august is not the best yes yes timing yeah august isn't the greatest time yeah, yeah. um i see a penny asking what's an example of a harder ask and i would say you know it always depends on the person and what um what they consider easy or hard for them you always want to use your insight into the person to help guide this, but like a harder ask might be, can I be a guest on your podcast or, you know, will you interview me for your newsletter or um, will you sponsor an event or will you email uh, three people and tell them about my book? Um, so those might be the harder things that just involve more time and energy for the person that you're asking. Whereas usually saying pick a pick one blurb from this list of three and give me your permission to put your name on it. it it's easy for someone to just type, yes, do it. <laughs> yeah. So Jane, I have a quick follow up on, on that because, uh, you know, because of my contacts in the area here, I, I actually have quite a good long list of people that I know have bought the book, mm -hmm. right. Of, and, uh, because they bought it directly from me or, or, or I, I've, I've just found out, right. If you talk to if people that you know is it is it fair to say you know you've read the book can you tell three other people about it oh, like sure. that's a very direct ask you know it, it seems a bit like uh uh you know it's very direct isn't it yes. so so yes. how do you feel about that yeah I, I i encourage it absolutely people need to be nudged 
a lot of people, especially outside of the writing and publishing community, don't know what would help you. And if they like you or they like the book or want to be helpful, the chances are they're going to they're going to do what they can. You know, I yeah. think it's you can just put one ask in the email, but if you know, you can also offer the menu, just keep it limited. Uh, for those who are listening, limited would probably be like a max of three, I would say. Otherwise, it starts to get out of control. Okay, I'm just uh, going to look in the chat here because I know there's been some activity. I want to see if there's any question I want to address. Uh, Dawn is asking, where's the best place to include blurbs in books, if not on the back cover? Could it be in the front of the book or back matter? Um, it could be front cover, back cover, uh, anywhere on the interior. Publishers usually put it on the first few pages. That's where those endorsements generally get stacked. Um, but they, you know, like I mentioned earlier, there's endless places to use these. You can use them in approach letters when you're pitching the media on your website, on your Amazon at page under editorial reviews. So if you just put them on the book and call it a day, I don't think you're using the full power of what these can do for you. Um, Joan's saying, make it easy uh, for people you approach, include direct URL links to where you want reviews. So it's one click for them. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you, Joan. Always include links. Um, usually to Amazon, Goodreads is another favorite um, or where, wherever it makes sense for you in your book. It's not always going to be those places, but that's the most common. Uh, Kent says, if the book is mostly sold on your own site, limited sales on Amazon, we're actually going to get to that very interesting issue in a minute here with, with David. Um, how can you get editorial reviews or blurbs on the Amazon listing? Um, for those who don't know, if you self, well, actually, it doesn't matter how you publish. If you have an Amazon author central account, which you, you can claim at any time as soon as you have a published book to your name, you can add those editorial reviews or blurbs to that page whenever you want. It's just a matter of going there and editing the page. But you do need to have an Am a free Amazon Author Central account where you'll need to create it um, and then log in and then you can make those changes yourself. So it doesn't matter where the site, or who's selling the most copies, as long as it's available on Amazon, you can make that change to the Amazon listing. And Nancy asks, is it all right to quote one of your book's reviews from Amazon and put the person's name? Do you need to ask them for permission? Best practice would, you know, if you're going to use customer reviews and quote them, it would, you don't necessarily need to ask for permission. Um, I've certainly in practice, I've seen lots of people do that. Um, I would just be cautious. Um, but I, it's hard to see how that would get you in trouble. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to keep moving on because I don't I don't want to get too far away from from our, the task at hand here. Uh, so, as I mentioned, there's some interesting background information here about where the book is selling right now, not on Amazon. So half are being sold on consignment, half are being sold direct. And I always like to build on what's working. So for me, this is not an opportunity to go push hard on Amazon. There are a lot, various qualities about this book that to me make it not that great of a sell or easy sell on Amazon. Um, that's not gonna be true for everyone, but for this fully illustrated art book, I, I think it is. David, do you wanna elaborate more on the consignment and the direct sales, how those are falling out? No, I totally I totally agree with that. But the uh... The, and and you know pretty well all have dried up except the National Gallery, which is a very good thing. They've actually they've actually bought rather than on consignment now, so I'm actual supplier to them. Uh, but the the actual volume of sales is is low, but the profile is good. Uh, Amazon, I've got I've had very very few sales through right and in fact the main use of amazon has been me through author copies shipping them to uh to uh, uh the overseas right yes. so yeah uh, so i totally agree with that and uh, the, uh, the that that's that's what i will try and do is uh, is is keep the uh, the 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 direct sales going and the consignments going yeah yeah for me, I would be looking at is is there are there any other places that should be carrying the book on consignment? Um, and we'll talk about ebooks a little bit later. Um, I don't know that that's 
necessarily an opportunity through Amazon, but it wouldn't hurt. It would, it would lift the profile of the book to have more editions out, but I just don't think that's where the opportunity lies. Okay. So here's the hard truth, which you already know, we, we chatted about this privately earlier. Because this book, book is focused on you and your art, it just makes it an inherently difficult um, because a lot rests on whether people know you or know your art or rec you know recognize you. So it's very much, it's one of these books that kind of succeeds or fails based on the level of visibility you have in the art community or in Ottawa. So it may be hard to pitch and gain traction for this book, this particular book, not other books, but this one in circles where just no one knows your name. So, you know, this is where if you have high profile clients or other people who can vouch for you or help spread the word or connect you to other communities where your name isn't known, I think that's where they could be very powerful for you. Having that social proof or recommendation would be useful for this book. I think it would be the sort of thing I would not do, which I've seen some authors do is like approach Barnes and Noble, or I guess in your case, it would be Indigo and say, you should carry my book. And they're going to be like, get out of here, <laughs> you know, unless you're, you know, name latest big artist here, you know, they're just probably not going to carry it. So you want to work in the circles or communities that are going to have some recognition of who you are and what you do for the community. Yep. I to totally, totally agree with that. The, and just a, to, just a quick, uh, quick story, right? I mean, I mean the reason our, reason my books in the in the national galleries we actually went in there and and presented one in their in their bookstore and there was a, like a personal connection with the with the person that was there in the store yes. and then and then then they decided to pick up and now 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 it's it's uh it's part of their uh uh part of their stock they right? so so i i'm gonna try that you know, approach, uh, you know, wherever I can, right? And, and I have some unsold books. So that's what that's probably the best plan for me to, to use them for. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you had a connection at that. Particular well, I know, I know it was a it was a cold, cold it was a okay. cold uh, visit. Yes. But you know, we, we, we the, it, uh, it was they, they were, they were very accessible once, once I got there on their doorstep, right? So, so Great. I feel I can do the same thing elsewhere. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So that's an example of where just being bold and, and walking in and talking with them produced good results. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, maybe it was because they'd heard things elsewhere as well, right? But that's how it worked. Yeah. Uh, Meg is saying that actually Barnes & Noble is very amenable if you go into the stores and ask them to carry your book. Um, if you're in their system, which probably means like if your book is distributed through Ingram, this will even, they will even work with you to get a book signing. Um, I hear really varied experiences. Um, so I'm glad Meg that you've had a good experience or that like you hear about good experiences. I don't always hear that. So certainly I, I think that authors have success getting into their local or regional Barnes and Noble for one-time events and, you know, it can, it can definitely work out, but for nationwide distribution, very, very difficult with a chain bookstore. All right. So your strengths, as I think have been demonstrated pretty clearly, you've got really good local and regional connections and presence, you've gotten the local media attention, and also the wild card here, which we haven't brought up yet, is that you actually have a pretty significant email subscriber list, a thousand names, which to me is, that is very, very useful. Now, how did you grow that list? How, tell us a little bit about the history of the list. Uh it's grown from uh, from uh, ex students. I would say, like uh, I would say, ninety percent, eighty to ninety percent are 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 through people I've worked with directly, plus with art clubs. I'm very act, uh, try and be very active in in the community. So, uh, and uh, past past painting uh, exhibitions. So, so really, I, I'm, 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 I'm pretty good at keeping uh, and keeping uh, uh, 
emails that way and uh, uh, and then being respectful with with their use right yes. so uh, so that's 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 how how I've got to about a thousand wonderful uh, subscribers yeah yeah wonderful excellent oh and quick tip David uh, Wendy says indigo has a shelf for local authors in Ottawa so if you haven't if you haven't walked into indigo maybe they would Maybe they would consider taking your book for the local yeah, no, show. I'll, I'll have another go at them because you know, the, the, and maybe maybe it's listed through Ingram Spark with uh, with Indigo now, but when mm. they they were certainly very very slow to list it. It may not be listed, but the Barnes and Noble and everyone else they just picked it up straight away. They didn't sell anything, but they it's it's there as a you know in their library, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yep. 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 It's in the database. Yep. <laughs> All right. So in my mind, marketing and promotion, anything you do to support your book from a business perspective is mainly about generating lots and lots and lots of ideas and trying things and seeing if they work. Um, there's no secrets here, no formula. So what I'm going to try doing here for you, David, is just generating as many ideas as we can in, in a small amount of time and then seeing where it takes you. Um, now, the email newsletter I want to talk about first, because I think this may be an untapped resource. Um, this is where you can ask your students, people who have bought the book to review it, you know, and like the earlier advice, you want to give them the link, give them a few suggestions of what they could write, because sometimes people just, they go blank, they're like, I don't know what to say, I want to review it, but what do I say? So you can give them some examples of what to say. Um, you could maybe offer an incentive for people to buy the book if they haven't already or leave a review. This is where I wonder if you offered a free PDF edition, if you felt comfortable with that um, as an incentive, or maybe you have something else. We'll talk, I, there's some, you do a lot of education and mentoring, so there might be some opportunities there. And the other thing I wonder is if you could interview other artists in your newsletter or have some piece of original content that helps build your network, bring attention to other artists. And that might also give you a reason to increase the frequency if you needed a reason to increase the frequency. Um, do any of these seem doable or like something you would look, you would act on? Yeah, they, they, they definitely seem do doable and, and, will be done i think i'd say but this there's one there's one uh thing i just backtrack slightly right mm -hmm. you know my knee email newsletter is not regular as clockwork and it doesn't look the same all the time i think i have to to i think the idea of having a regular newsletter with uh broader content you know including you know interviews with other artists uh you know in general interest from other industries as you've done jane with uh with uh electric speed and mm -hmm. you know the 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 most recent one on the fitness industry yes. you know the, these these are just things which uh i i can do much more more about more with yeah. and uh and and i think this is probably my 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 prime uh you know thing uh, you know other than changing the text on the on on amazon mm -hmm. is uh, is something i'm going to get straight on to yes yeah yep. wonderful how how often have you been sending did you did, ah, I'm, so what I, what so what i do is i is is i send i i send i send out the the email uh uh, uh at least or at least monthly to okay, to actually about half the list and the other is quarter the other half of it is is quarterly Okay. Right. So I so I have it segmented depending on the uh, the 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 currency of uh, of the uh, uh, you know the the association, if you like. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's very smart. Okay. So monthly is a, a good frequency, um, which you could stick with if you wanted to be more aggressive. I think um, every two weeks would be totally accepted by most list members. Right. If if you know if it weren't self-promotional or like if it had other things of interest to them like an interview or q a or something i think that's the key isn't it that's the key you can do it frequently as long as you're adding content which is is useful to people's lives yeah, yeah. yeah precisely all right so something i was curious about like i i haven't been to ottawa i've been to canada but i haven't been to ottawa I don't have a lot of knowledge about your community. Um, so I started just using online tools to start generating sites or lookalike 
audiences that maybe you haven't thought about or approached or tapped, um, there's a very specific tool I use called Spark Toro. I'm going to type the name into the chat because I know people will ask about it as soon as I say it. How do you spell that again? It's very weird. Um, so sparktoro.com is a tool that I just think is super dead easy for quickly generating lookalike places for you to target. Um, lookalike simply means people who like X will probably like Y. Um, so my question for Spark Toro was, what are other places or sites or social accounts that are like the Ottawa School of Art? What are uh, what other people or organizations are associated with art in Canada? Now, David, you could probably like, I imagine, brainstorm these sorts of lists without consulting a tool um, because you live there and you are part of the community. Um, but as an outsider, you know, I, I have to use these tools. Do any of the websites or social accounts you see listed, do any of those resonate with you or do they indicate to you, oh yeah, I really need to approach them? Well, apart from I, I mean, I've, 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 I've had, had some, uh, you know, I've targeted a couple of them, mm -hmm. but there's a lot more here than, uh, than, than I've, uh, I've been looking at, and they, they all seem to make a lot of sense. So I think there's, 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 there's I think this is a fantastic, uh, s sort of, uh, you know generation of of ideas for me so, and although yeah. though i'm here i mean obviously you know some of the news outlets that i'm aware aware of right it just makes it that much more more tangible that uh you know sort of i should uh i should uh uh be active here right and and yeah. one or two i don't recognize as well right sort of app 613 for example yeah well, i don't know what that so is I don't know, I'm gonna do, i'll have to check that out yeah there, you know, you'll notice there are some results here that are more about like current events, like Ottawa Public Health. I'm sure is related to COVID. Um, yeah. So, like, you'll have to filter out the ones that are obviously unrelated. But I, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So obviously, you see, there's a little show more uh, link. So if you were to use Spark Toro more fully, you could dive even deeper. This is kind of like the most obvious choices to start. Right. I've got some more results too. This is uh, a screen capture of the Spark Toro site. I went in and I typed in uh, Canadian artist for this particular search. You can, I suggest doing varieties of searches because you never know what will come up. Like you could try Ottawa art, Canadian artist, whatever you think would be relevant. And then you'll see here, we've got a list of um, social accounts that are talking about Canadian artists. Again, this is just the top like the cream of the crop as it's actually interesting as you get deeper into the results that's often where you find the more valuable results because you get into individuals and people who are hungry for content and making connections whereas you know some of the really big big organizations are just harder to crack although i would encourage you to try because you've already cracked some good big organizations already okay uh, Joan mentions, just seeing, um, Susie is wondering what I think of Joan's idea, but I'm not sure if she, Susie, are you referring to Joan Dempsey or Joan Ramirez? Um, so I'll need some clarity to, to answer that question. Dempsey, okay, so Joan's saying, I have a box of old advanced review copies of my 2017 novel and just thought I might offer to ship those for free to a new ARC team to get a bunch of new reviews. Um, I would absolutely do it, yes. Um, it's also very common for publishers themselves to use those, just use extra copies, whether they're advanced review copies or hardcovers left over while you're going to paperback, uh, to use those um, for any sort of marketing or giveaway campaign, especially right before a new book comes out. So yes, I, you, know, you will have the shipping costs there, of course, but often it's worth it. Okay. Uh, here's a, some more results from Spark Toro. These are uh, specific websites. Some of them are, it's very obvious what they are. Others, I'm not entirely sure. But again, it's um, noticed too that uh, we've got the social accounts where these places 
are active, which can also be very fruitful to take a look at, because I think what you'll find, David, well, any author, is once you start diving into media outlets, so they have different things that they offer in different places. So they might have a certain feature that's only on the website, but then they have like maybe live chats on Instagram, um, or they have special uh, live offerings on Twitter or live chats. So it really bears drilling down into each to see where you might fit into what they offer so that you can customize your approach and say, I noticed that on Instagram, you do a live chat with an artist every, you know, every week. And would you feature me? So that always, I think, pays off better rather than just making making a generic approach. I think this is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so Maggie is saying, uh, so going back to the Joan question, um, Joan's suggestion of an additional tagline, so I think I don't have to go back and see. Um, maybe she, Joan, was asking about um, if you should have a subtitle on your book, I think that might have been the suggestion at some point. Um, I don't, I, I mean, I'll give my opinion on it. For the, the sort of book that this is, I don't normally see subtitles, but I don't think it would be wrong to have a subtitle. What do you think, David? Yeah, I, I actually, I had one in the end. In the end, I, I, uh, I took it off because I thought that, uh, you know, I didn't want to be too directive, and I mm -hmm. felt like even it, it, it was going to fly based on my name and my art, right. or it wasn't, and I didn't want to kind of tell people more about what it was, Let, leave a little bit of mystery on the cover. Yeah, that's exactly what I, that's the practice that I see with books like, like this one. Um, the book, I wouldn't call it a how-to book, would you? No, no, it's not a how-to book, but it has yeah. some some useful information for visual artists that's yes. that's not medium specific right. or style specific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, this is one of the sites that I ended up visiting after looking at the Spark Toro results. Um, artists in Canada. Again, this, these are. I'm not in Canada, so I don't know anything about this organization or your relationship to it, but it seems to me like there might be something here, maybe. Um, and then the other thing I did, which these results did not come from Spark Toro, but now as a marketing exercise, I always go to Substack because they have a pretty good search engine for Substack newsletters. And I type in the topic that I'm searching for publicity on. Um, so in this instance, I typed in Canada art and also Ottawa. So I came up with these three newsletters, um, Ottawa start, which seems to cover, you know, just media and entertainment in Ottawa. We've got the Canadian art forecast and then Michael's newsletter that highlights culture, feud, music, Canadian art and artists. Do you know any of these folks? Does any of this look familiar to you? It's, there's no right or wrong answer. I'm just curious. Ottawa start rings bell. Okay. The, the other two, the other two, no, I haven't, uh, okay. I haven't encountered them. So to me, that's just, you know, you so, obviously want to take a look at the newsletters, see if they're doing anything of interest. Yeah. Is there an opportunity here for them to cover you? Um, could you write a guest post for them if they have yeah. guests, et cetera? And maybe they're good connections to have uh, in the long run for lots of different reasons. What I like is that anyone who starts a Substack is probably pretty, uh, is a creator, probably a little bit entrepreneurial, and uh, might be very open to hearing from mm. you. Absolutely. Well, this is all great. Uh, you know, as you can tell, Jane, you know, sort of this, this the social media and general access to information that's that's out there. This is just a big eye, eye opener. Yeah. 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 And I wanted, you brought up social media. I want to uh, mention to everyone, I have not really brought up social media aside from as a research tool. Um, it is possible to market and promote a book without being on social media. So a lot of the things we're discussing here are not dependent on being active on social, although you might certainly go after people or organizations with a big social media following and essentially borrow it for your own purposes. Um, and I just want to add, David, I think, David, you have a, a solid website and you've got your email newsletter set up. So that's excellent because once you start appearing in places like these newsletters or other media outlets, 
always make sure that they're linking back to your website or mentioning your newsletter yeah. so that you're getting that extra value from the publicity. Right. Yeah. Um, Gail's asking if Substack is a search engine, and then Leslie is responding that Substack is a newsletter platform, kind of like MailChimp or Constant Contact. Um, so yeah, Substack helps people start and send email newsletters, although it's become much more than that over time. Um, but for our purposes today, it's for sending newsletters. And you can search it like any directory. Okay. All right, so another exercise that you might think about, and you again, you probably know some of this already, what art related events or festivals could you participate in because you do such a good job of selling direct and selling consignment and in Ottawa, I feel like there's many more opportunities like that and you could likely do very well at events I'm even thinking of you having if you would be comfortable like having an easel or like butcher paper or something and doing like some live demonstrations um, while you have your book available for sale, if you have the money to pay for like a table or a booth. Um, but I went to Google, again, very useful for this sort of research. I just typed in Ottawa Art Festival and it automatically generates a box with all of these events coming up. Um, if you were open to traveling, you can do this with any city or province where right. you just wanna check out what's going on. Have you, is this something that appeals to you? It's not for everyone, but do you feel comfortable doing this in per, selling in person? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of comfortable uh, with the process. In fact, you know, as a visual artist, right, you know, sort of, I've done uh, sort of art shows and things, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, and festivals and I've, they, they, they are, the only thing I would say, Jane, is they are very time intensive, Yes, for yes. you know walk by clients right so so i've not I, I i mean i'll be quite candid i've not really sold my art through you know sort of uh you know yep. week, weekend weekend art shows yep. and things for for quite a few years now because i found that they you know there's a lot of a lot of time you know sitting sit, sitting there although i was i i have to say in my in my in my to my credit i think i'm the only only I was the only one at one show that's actually doing some painting, right? So I, yes. I I made it work because I did some painting at the same time, right? And right. Maybe that's the key, right? Is, it is. is do two things, right? Yeah. It is totally key. Um, anytime you're at these festivals, um, you have to find some way of staying engaged. If you yeah. if you sit behind the table on your phone, that's nothing's gonna happen. So, but for artists, I feel like like for writers, it can be very problematic because you can't sit and write and do it like a live demonstration writing yeah. it doesn't well sometimes poets can do poems on demand but anyway as an artist you know you've got something exciting i think that you can do and that will maybe bring people over okay yeah. so next idea what other artists do you know and can you partner on events i think that you know it can feel very lonely going to these festivals or whatever by yourself or trying to do book, bookstore events, especially by yourself, I think can be challenging. Um, if there are other artists that are like you, can you partner on something um, for a bigger commitment? If it's something that really interested you, like an artist in conversation series, this would be kind of the equivalent of an author conversation series that often runs in many cities. Um, would that be workable? But it, it is hugely time intensive, right? Like if you do a, uh, a recurring series and you would ideally want to be partnered with an established venue like the Ottawa School of Art or, or, or a bookstore or someone that's invested in, in hosting these conversations where you're not paying for the venue, you know, they, they just, they, if you're able to bring the people into the space, you know, it becomes good marketing and publicity for them too. Yeah, you, I, 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 I totally, I, I totally think this is an area where, where, where something good could happen. I just, I just, uh, I, I would just not know exactly what that would be like immediately, right? It's one of these yeah. things that's going to percolate. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. So Jasmine is asking for ideas on how to adapt some of these strategies to non-art books like literary fiction. I mean, for this particular idea, it's pretty straightforward. We're talking about other authors, but you know, 
you, I think it's helpful to mix it up when you're thinking about events and festivals and trying to find ways to draw all sorts of people in. So you'll sometimes see very creative conversation based events that's that mixes artists and musicians or or art authors and artists or, you know, bringing the different arts together, bringing in artists, musicians, authors, designers. Um, sometimes that's Provide, it's more exciting too for people who come in and you get a, a better cross section um, of people coming in. So if you are online oriented, you want to be thinking about if there are any online communities where you could participate and be of service. I, for the purposes of today's session, I didn't focus much on online activity, but you could certainly move in that direction. I found a Facebook group of Ottawa artists, uh, five and a half thousand members that, you know, could probably help you find artists or partners or opportunities. But, you know, when you, I, I don't get the sense that you're active on Facebook, David, is that true? It's, it's true. I'm not, I'm not active on Facebook. There's, uh, uh, and, and I've been, uh, I've been a little bit uh, sort of wait and see as to what what I should do with social media. Yes. Uh, you know, recognizing it, it takes takes a bit of a commitment to, you know, one platform or another or perhaps a pair of platforms. If you're going to make some kind of difference. Right. I felt that uh, I'd be spreading too thin. Yes. Um, these groups can be very useful. Um, in terms of networking and connections and visibility, but it does take time, like, because you also have to just filter through all the stuff that is totally not relevant <laughs> to your interests. Yeah. And sometimes the groups aren't moderated well, and that makes it difficult, you know, to extract value from them. So it's really going to be dependent on the group, whether or not it's worth your time. Um, but this would be the example of something that could could be valuable. Yeah. Now, uh, just uh, let me ask though, Jane, it, uh, for 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 authoring, right? Are there are are all social media platforms equal, or are there there are some which are more equal than others? In my opinion, the best one is the one you can live with and participate in without feeling burdened, distressed, and anxious. Um, which, granted, I understand there might be some amount of that, no matter which one you choose. But the one that you can be happiest getting along with, most social media networks are enormous, like billions of people or approaching a billion people. So even if you, if your perfect demographic isn't largely represented on that platform, you're still talking about thousands, oops, cat action again. We're still talking about thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands usually of people. So it's not something I would worry about. Oh, I heard that all of the young people are on TikTok. So now I have to get on TikTok. It's no, you don't. Um, yeah, I, heard, I heard that too, by the way. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's very particular. It, you have to just, uh, I, I, I shouldn't get into it. We'll, we'll, we'll be here all day if I, I get on my soapbox about this. You just have to choose the platform that you, you can live with. I'll leave it at that. Um, but I find that for most people, you know, they can understand and use Facebook fine. Instagram is usually number two, and then Twitter is usually number three. Um, so, but it just depends. Okay. Another site I found, I think I found this one through Spark Toro. This, this actually... I think this would be something that might interest you in the future, not necessarily for the current book, but it just seems like this is a broad reaching site that ties into some of your own mission to, to help artists and develop artists. So I don't know what opportunities might exist here, but that's just something for future hmm. audience engagement. Okay, so now we come to the ebook question. Should you do an ebook edition? And this is not a straightforward question if you've got a full color illustrated title like you do. For those of you listening, if you're doing a novel or a memoir or a full text, um, something without illustrations, absolutely yes, do the ebook. You must do the ebook. <laughs> um, but for this very unique situation, it's going to cost some significant money because you really need someone to hand code the ebook file in order to retain that what I'll call page integrity. 
So like in the example I have here on the slide, we've got the image on the right, we've got the recipe on the left, and you don't want that reflowing or reconfiguring when people read it on their device. You want it to retain that spread integrity. So I feel like the same applies to your book, David, where it's really necessary for things to stay put and that requires someone to do the ebook file for you. And I just really hesitate to suggest that, um, probably talking a minimum of $500 uh, US. So unless people have been asking for a digital edition, I don't know that I would go in that direction. Um, I think a PDF, though, would be great for marketing purposes like we discussed earlier. Had, did you look into having the, the ebook done? At all. Okay, so, so I haven't looked into having the ebook done, but I have done some, I'd say now significant research on on ebooks, and uh, and and I've looked at uh, reflowable, right? You know, sort of the lots of you know, sort of you know, uh, Kindle can give you you know, sort of help for as one. I mean, not to be exclusive, but you know, mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of helpful stuff yes. out there they uh i've uh with a little bit of coding background i've even looked at sort of whether do it doing some 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 coding myself right the uh the uh and uh you know it is it is a minefield and and i think i would be exact in exactly the same situation as you're saying there 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 jane that it, it i i concluded it had to be a a page integrity book mm -hmm. and there's not much market for it in the yeah. main uh main ebook space uh a pdf uh, uh uh file is 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 i think important that i have that yep. i haven't used it too much but I'll, I'll add one extra thing right is because i i actually did all the production and formatting and such like for my 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 book myself anyway right the uh, so so what i have done is i have reformatted it for a single page integrity, right? Sort of mm -hmm. as opposed to the original one is a page spread, just as you show there for the for a cookery mm -hmm. book. I've I've reformatted it for um, for better visibility on 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 screens and as a single page view. Mm -hmm. Right. So if that's useful to anyone as a uh, as uh, uh, an approach, that is doable, right? Yeah. So so I've had to swap some pages around, right? Because you know image has to follow text as opposed to you know the, the, the otherwise an image just appears and you don't know what it means the uh, and and some other changes right the you know i've i've reduced margins so it appears more on the screen things like that mm -hmm. the so so that is doable as a, as a pdf and i'll probably use it as a giveaway but it reads better yeah than the original book right yeah. as a, a, a in in a, in a on any any technology yeah yeah, excellent. You're going in the right direction there. Okay. So if you were interested in selling more online, and just for those who missed it, to clarify, David's book is selling now mainly on consignment, print copies at various um, galleries or bookstores, and also he's selling directly. Um, if you would want to see things sell online, I think it would have to be a different kind of book, or you would need to become like overnight famous and everyone's searching for David Kern's art. <laughs> so here is the sort of book I happen to know from experience uh, in my publishing history. This is the sort of book that sells really well online and for a long, long time. So this book uh, is actually by my first boss in book publishing, Greg Albert. He was um, the editorial director of Northlight Books, which published hundreds, thousands of books over the years on how to, how to be a better artist. And he did this book called The Simple Secret to Better Painting. I think it initially came out like 20 years ago, maybe even longer, and it's still selling. Um, so, and he's not, he's like doing zero to promote it, but people, this, this sort of title, and notice the subtitle here, how to immediately improve your art with the one rule of composition. Like, it's like catnip. Um, David, if you've been teaching artists for a long time, I imagine you probably know this sort of thing is catnip. Um, yeah. but if you were doing, you've mentioned, you know, the possibility of doing other sorts of books or companions or add-ons, and this is the direction I would go in. And I think what you'll find is if that, if you do some of these sorts of like nuts and bolts, how to books, it actually leads to increased sales for the stuff that's more um, 
uh, like advanced or more um, not as direct do this step one, two, three. Um, this is another example um, that goes broader. So this is like a broad book on creativity by Austin Kleon that's been a bestseller uh, for years now. And he illustrated the whole thing. He's an author artist. This does well, again, because it's very prescriptive. And finally, I'll even throw another art form in here, uh, filmmaking, David Lynch was able to take kind of whatever goes on in his head, which is pretty strange, <laughs> and distill it into catching the big fish, meditation, consciousness, and creativity. I have this book and it's marvelous. Uh, very thin volume though. It's not, it's, it's, Oh, gosh, I'd be surprised if it had even 20,000 words in it. Um, so in any event, David, if you have, I'm sure that's whatever, whatever's in 18 pieces um, is wonderful. If you were able to turn it into something more prescriptive, or if you have follow-ons that are more prescriptive, I think you'll have more luck selling it online if that, if that interests you. Is, is yeah, this direction? Then, then, oh yeah, you go ahead. No, I was going to say, and then that, then that would, kind of then 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 the the book's not not a uh, an orphan and yes. it becomes a little bit more like a part of a part of a, a group right so I, I definitely agree with that and and I've pulled out a few key ideas from the book that I thought might I could focus on in something that's a little bit more prescriptive yeah yep, yep. wonderful um so I thought if you wanted to get moving in that direction right away and you wanted to kind of build in your audience or platform for it to make it easier to market, you know, you can think about writing really short snippets of art or creativity instruction. This could go in your email newsletter, for example, and then at some point in the future, you combine it into a book. So I think like matchbook size instructions, like, yeah, I don't know if this, if you would have seen... I don't know if this was in Canada, but do you, does anyone remember the matchbooks with the art instruction on the inside? That's kind of what I'm what I'm thinking about. Yeah, I, lo I love it. No, I <laughs> not encountered this before, right? But yeah, uh, yeah, no, I I I I'm I'm to I totally with you in in pulling some uh, some messages and ideas out of out of the book, right? Then and, and and actually, you know, the other way around as well. Like a lot of you know some of the things that were in the, the book came from my my blogging uh and emailing over the over the teaching of course as well over the years right so so it's kind of that's uh, it it works both ways eh yes yep. yes it does but things can become a book and then a book can become things yeah okay so we've got some questions in the q a box i apologize that i didn't get to all of the questions that came up in the chat but if you're still around and want your question answered, uh, do drop it in the Q&A box if you're able to, and that way I can, I can still catch it. Um, before I get to the Q&A, though, I'm going to put in a link into the chat. Uh, this is what I call my effective book marketing resource list, uh, which is a really gargantuan collection of how to market and promote a book, regardless of whether it's new or old. Um, split into categories like if you want to advertise, uh, if you want to pursue reviews, if you want to do events, um, and, you know, and on and on. So I know that, you know, this session, because David's done a nonfiction book, was a little slanted towards things that work for nonfiction. This resource list will give you all sorts of ideas regardless of your genre or category. So be sure to get that link before you go today. Okay, so before I open it up to the Q and A box, David, do you have any questions for me? Uh, no, I actually, you know, really just uh, just interested to sort of participate in the in the Q and A, uh, and you know, I th I think this has been spectacular for 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 giving me a sort of bit of direction and a, and a good nudge as to things I can be doing. Yeah. Good. Good. All right, uh, Maddie asks uh, for thoughts about including editorial reviews and blurbs at the beginning of the description on the retail site. So like at the top of your Amazon description versus for example, in the field for editorial reviews. So yes, I would totally consider doing this if you have a really fabulous blurb or endorsement that just nails the book's reason for being or benefit 
um, by all means, put that in the book description itself. Um, of course, publishers often will say something like New York Times bestseller or, you know, uh, recommended by Oprah. So if you have those like really amazing things to put it, put in the description, uh, put them there, put them at the top, make them bold, put them in caps, <laughs> whatever you can do to, to draw attention. Uh, Lara is asking, I have a book coming up on a 10 year anniversary. Are there unique strategies tied to raising the profile of something like that? Um, those anniversaries can be very meaningful for you, the author. The, the time anniversaries aren't always meaningful for readers or media outlets, um, unless the book's quite successful or something dramatic has changed over the last 10 years that might make the book feel like, oh, it's really interesting to see what's happened in the last decade. Um, so you'll need to think about instead of the meaning for you, the meaning for the market. And think about, is there any sort of partner, organization, uh, someone else who has a stake in that book or in the genre or in the outcome that might be willing to celebrate that 10 year anniversary with you? Um, it's always better if you don't go it alone on these things and if you have some other people that might join in the celebration with you. So Jane, Jane, could I j just ask, uh, would, would you do consider a revision or yes. update or making something like a big, big, uh, big splash about that? Yeah, if you have, uh, I, publishers, of course, put out new editions to celebrate those milestones. So it could be, it's usually it starts at 10 year. It's hard to imagine it coming earlier, 10 year, 20 year, 25 year, 50 year. Um, at Writer's Digest, we often did this with our evergreen backlist titles. We would do the new release of the new edition. And so that gives you the built-in uh, marketing and publicity angle. Yes, thank you for bringing that up, David. Uh, Britta says, there are a variety of paid review services for authors, um, like PW's Book Life and Kirkus, and there's lots of mixed feelings in the self-publishing community about these paid reviews. How helpful can they be to new self-publishing authors? I find that they play a more important role in the children's market where it can be really hard to gain traction with librarians and educators and teachers unless you have someone saying, yes, this book, uh, you can give it to children and everything will be okay. Um, that market, I think, is just, it's just tougher as a self-published author to get buy-in from, from that market. I'm going to put in the chat a link to my very long post discussing paid reviews. For the most part, I don't think it's worth it for self-publishing authors, and I don't recommend paying for it. Um, and I, obviously, David, for you, I, I wouldn't do it here. I think you, pro you have, first of all, you, your book is at the National Gallery, and you were at the Ottawa School of Art for your launch, and you have other things that you can do to establish the social proof. And then once you get some endorsements from your VIPs, I think you're going to be all set. So I would definitely not go after a paid review in this scenario. Right. Yeah. Uh, we've got a longtime author uh, in the Q&A box with some two successful books, um, now trying to get a coaching business off the ground, has a mailing list of 7,000 people, uh, asking if I do private consulting. Um, I don't do private consulting anymore, but I, you can apply to be in the next clinic. So this is why I do clinics so that people with uh, problems that I know lots of people have, we can address those and, and everyone can benefit. Uh, Maggie says, I didn't mention podcasts, but she thinks, David, you would make an ideal guest. Thank you, Maggie. I agree. We didn't touch on podcasts today, but I do. Let me actually stop the share here, and I'm going to do a different sort of share. I Let's see. I tried going to this site. It's called Listen Notes. It's a podcast search engine. So it's kind of like Googling around for podcasts. And I did come here and I looked for, um, I think I looked for Ardoa Art maybe. And I just didn't find anything that I really liked um, that was coming up that seemed obvious. But yes, I would, for all of you listening and for you too, David, it's worth poking around here to see if there might be something you could pitch yourself for. Um, I just didn't see anything immediately like come up that I thought would be relevant, but 
I think I didn't dig deeply enough. Do you, David? Do you listen to any yeah. podcasts? Actually, I don't. I don't listen to to too many podcasts. Although, well, actually, TED talks and things like that. My wife and I watch watch a lot of. Right. So, so I I I, I do think this is something that that uh, that I that I can pursue because you know I'm 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 comfortable. I've done lots of uh, sort of. Uh, uh, you know, Zoom courses and things, right? Mm -hmm. And actually this year, my wife and I have done a couple of podcasts for our audience, right? And there are, nice. you know, one's, one's on my YouTube channel. We, we didn't talk about YouTube, it's more visual, but, you know, I've got a YouTube channel too, right? And uh, not, not, not that needs developing. Uh, and, and so I, I think I would be very comfortable sort of being, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the kind of podcast sphere right so I, i'm gonna note that down as something to uh to look at too fabulous well, a lot of work to do here yes I? the list yeah. gets longer yeah. that's what we so, want yeah the other thing i would mention for those feeling um more entrepreneurial or exploratory is clubhouse so this is to me is like a it's a lower threshold to cross clubhouse is an app where it's i think it's called drop in audio chat so it's like live podcasting going on in, in thousands of different rooms at once. Um, and some rooms may have a dozen people, other rooms may have hundreds of people. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if how much artists are using Clubhouse or how much Canadians are using Clubhouse, but that would be another place where you could try seeing are your people there and then dropping in on conversations and, and seeing where that leads. You can also host mm -hmm. live conversations there yourself so you don't have to just drop in on others. You can start your own. Um, but of course, it can feel very lonely to start a conversation room and, and no one shows up. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sonia says, I need to do a new edition for my nonfiction book because much has changed in the financial world um, because some information in my present book is outdated. Should I stop sales of the present book? Um, not necessarily, but, you know, it's, it's going to be up to you to decide at what point you might be harming yourself by selling it. Like if you're getting complaints from your readers, or if you're starting to see negative reviews of the book, it might mean it's time to take it down. Um, so it's, I think it's a personal decision and it's probably going to be based on feedback from the market. Uh, Donna asks about Publishers Weekly. Uh, she says a third novel of someone who's been reviewed in PW, The New York Times, The New Yorker, um, was published by an independent publisher, and for some reason it wasn't reviewed in Publishers Weekly. Maybe the publisher missed the deadline. Now it's getting awards. Is there any remediation for a lack of a Publishers Weekly review? Gosh, I mean, to me, it sounds like there's already been remediation, like if they're, you know, if, if they've been reviewed in these other places, hold on, let me reread the question here. Um, usually, see, the thing with Publishers Weekly is that it's an industry publication, meaning it's for booksellers and librarians to base their orders on before the book is out in the world. So Publishers Weekly doesn't publish reviews after the fact. It has to be before the book comes out. So I don't know that I mean, that ship has sailed, right? So you have to look at other ways to get reviews if they're important. And it's going to be a post-publication review if the book is already out rather than a pre-publication review. So you have to shift your strategy um, to customer reviews as well as media outlets that don't care as much whether the book is new or not. And then Edward is asking the perfect ending question, which is how to review the recording of this event. Um, it's going to be on my YouTube channel. I'm going to put that link right here in the chat. It will be uploaded there and available uh, by this afternoon. And David, any last questions before we sign off? Uh, no, no, other than uh, the, uh, it's just just to thank, thank you, thank you and Mark again for this, uh, this opportunity. It's been, uh, been really, really useful for me and uh and if it's uh and if it helps uh a whole bunch of us just uh that's just one wonderful eh? yeah yes so, thank you david for so, you know for being on stage here and, and open to the critique and and putting all your cards on the table right. it's well, it's the transparency helps everyone and that's great uh, just just delighted to be able to participate yeah yeah thank thank you all for joining us this morning and i hope to see you at a future clinic or webinar have a great day. Okay. Okay.
Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Bye.